Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to FX Closing Bell for Wednesday, July 19th. My name is Tyler Yell. I'm a currency analyst and trading instructor here at Daily FX. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here and bring you some of the key themes that we're watching, some of the stories that are developing and things that we are anticipating, namely, of course, the uh, European Central Bank and Bank of Japan uh, rate announcement, which is expected to stay, quite simply, on track with their current pace. However, we're looking for signals as to whether or not the Bank of Japan will hold the course through 2018, being basically the only central bank not tightening in 2018, uh, and whether the ECB will try and uh, pat down, if you will, or, 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 or bat down uh, the strong euro. We'll take a look at some charts there on the euro and things that are developing there, but uh, fireworks are expected to come uh, roughly a month from now uh, when Draghi speaks at Jackson Hole. But before I get on with that, let me take care of some housekeeping if you guys do not mind. Uh, I'll start with our risk disclaimer. Uh, put that up for a few seconds. Uh, it talks about the risks of trading on margin. Uh, next it, disclaimer is our hypothetical trading disclaimer, uh, stating quite simply that uh, there are no guaranteed profits, uh, that there will not be uh, there will not be explicit trade details mentioned in this webinar, meaning I will not tell you enter here, exit here with this trade size, place to stop here, any of that. Uh, this will be more informative in nature. Uh, however, I will present my biases, things that I'm looking at, uh, things that I think that I could develop things that would trigger me into a trade. Uh, and, and so if you have questions about that, you are welcome to ask. A uh, question about gold uh, from Renee, we'll definitely take a look at that. Um, and, and, and also, uh, just just so you guys know, uh, if you have questions on things that I share here, uh, sometimes I will pull out what, what seem to be um, some unusual, for lack of a better word, uh, so, you know, some unusual ways to measure what's going on in the market. Uh, and, and, and quite simply, it's usually, uh, it's usually a way to get an idea as to where there is demand um, and, 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 and where there is pressures developing in the market. So um, what what I hope to do is give you a well-rounded picture, but uh, if, if, if something is new to you or you don't fully grasp it the first time you hear it, which is fine, feel free to shoot me an email, tl at dailyfx.com. You're also welcome to reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, another thing worth noting is that by registering for this webinar, you do get access to a demo account from IG. It's completely your, your prerogative if you want to use it. If you do um, and you have questions about a trading strategy, tra trading strategy, strategy, excuse me, <laughs> uh, you're welcome to reach out to me uh, and I could hopefully point you in the direction of things that we offer uh, that might be of help to you. Um, and uh, again, welcome to hit me up on email or Twitter. Uh, for those of you that are new, uh, I do would like to uh, to welcome the newcomers always. Uh, this is about a 30 minute session where we spend our time running through the key markets, which I look at as fixed income or rates, uh, commodities and FX. Uh, and um, I'll often again pull from other markets as well uh, to, to help to help show you what is developing or what pressures are building uh, in different parts of the market. Uh, with that, let's go on to really our, our top story and things that we're looking at here. Uh, and, and while we are within the shadows, if you will, of the ECB um, and the BOJ, uh, BOJ, there is not a set time for when the announcement is made. It tends to be 12 o'clock p.m. Tokyo time, uh, but nonetheless, uh, there, there, there is not there's not really expectations that will get any t any change of course. Uh, what's of course in focus uh, is is whether or not the BOJ is going to mention anything about the significant holdings that they have. Uh, many of you have likely heard of their just nonstop, nonstop, absolutely persistent purchasing of assets in an effort to try and pull up inflation, and that's just nowhere to be found. In fact, uh, there's an increasing number of people on the board at the Bank of Japan uh, that believe that 2018 will not will not see much progress on their on their inflation targets, and that's as you can imagine uh, a problem. The spending spree that spending spree that started in 2013 from the Bank of Japan uh, has has brought about um, this this purchase of JGBs to which the Bank of Japan now owns about 40% of that market, as well as more than 70% of all shares in Japan-listed Japan ETFs, uh, at least according to Bloomberg. Um, and, and so you have that, you have negative interest rates, and, and still we don't really have, we don't really have uh, signs of inflation. Um, and, and, you know, quite simply, we, again, don't expect them to, to change course. Uh, in fact, we have heard from, uh, from Haruhiko Kuroda, the bank's governor, uh, that it is you know, quite simply, 
not even a thought that they would stop purchases um, in, until they until they can hit their target. He, I think the words he specifically said last month was, it is generally unthinkable um, that we would stop the easing program before we hit our inflation target. However, what they seem to be doing doesn't seem to be working. So uh, that's that, that to me is what's uh, worth watching. One thing I'll share with you, uh, if you look at the overnight options, which is basically a market that shows uh, price down volatility, uh, for Euro Yen, it's the highest since mid-April when we had the first round of the French election. So uh, though there's not there's not an expected rate announcement, rate cut, rate hike, change in, in QE programs uh, from either central banks. Um, there's, I think, uh, there's a decent amount to keep an eye on here. Uh, in terms of top chart, I'll get to Euro USD in just a moment. Uh, we are basically hitting what looks to be potentially uh, short-term resistance, and I'll, I'll tell you why in just a moment. Uh, but this 1530, 1550 zone looks to be uh, potentially a, to use Elliott Wave terminology, uh, a wave five of a of a larger wave three, uh, meaning we could see a bit of a pullback. We'll talk about what could what could bring that about, uh, but nonetheless, I don't think that we are done uh, with with euro dollar upside uh, sentiment perspective. And I'll, I'll show you a broader picture of sentiment with IG client sentiment, uh, a tool available for you guys to use on uh, daily FX if you wish. Uh, in fact, let me get the get the link for you guys. So if you want to take a look at it yourselves, you're absolutely welcome to. Uh, but uh, one, one thing that we're seeing right now is a sharp drop in euro yen bulls, which Either way you look at it, we tend to come into the sentiment picture from a contrarian standpoint, meaning that if people, if, if bulls are getting out of the market, that might be a sign that upside could continue because, again, we're taking a contrarian view to retail sentiment. Um, however, that's not as strong as a signal historically as a engaging position, meaning like an increase in short positions would be a more favorable bullish picture than a drop in long positions. I hope that makes sense, but I'll show you that chart later. Uh, and then Aussie dollar remains our strong weak pair, um, meaning that if nothing else, and in fact, let me see if I can uh, pull up that chart for us. Uh, if nothing else, uh, it, it basically discourages us from right now selling the Australian dollar or buying the US dollar. And the reason why is because that would mean you're either either uh, buying the weakest currency, which on a relative basis is the uh, is the US dollar, or you are selling the strongest currency right now, which is the Australian dollar. Uh, and, and again, we had RBA minutes. Um, and, and there's a question here about, you know, looking at um, looking at the jobs report with with Aussie, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but uh, still don't want to sell the strongest currency. So good question there. All right, let's go to the movers and shakers of today's session. So uh, one of the things that we've seen in no uncertain terms uh, is the emerging market currencies really come back uh, into the picture. Uh, most notably, the South African Rand. In fact, let me go ahead and pull up dollars are. Um, so uh, we've seen this move back. This, this basically has been a consolidation, uh, and 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 while it's too early to me to say that this this consolidation is over yet. You can see the bias there is for a strong breakdown, uh, meaning that we, we continue on with this trend. Now, the market that I've actually preferred the most in terms of EMFX uh, has been dollar max. And, and again, when I look at this market and when I look at other markets, it, it's, it's the story that's behind the demand for one asset over the other. Uh, and so that demand for uh, the peso uh, might be twofold. One might be quite simply the yield that is provided. Uh, and, and, we, and we continue to see a search for yield in the market. Uh, we see a very low volatility picture in the treasury market, which we'll talk, we'll talk about specifically when we get to the rates themes. Uh, but also it, it might mean that you know, we're, we're not seeing that political force out of Washington uh, and the US that was previously thought. So that uh, quite simply uh, that the, the sell-off in MEX that took dollar MEX up to 22 back in December, um, we continue to retrace that. And, and again, with what we've heard, the, the quote unquote political gridlock this week uh, just continues to drive that forward. So, uh, and, and of course, that is also leading to views that we might not see the inflation in the U.S. that was previously thought. So, uh, political statements completely aside, uh, you could see here that EMFX uh, continuing to continuing to do rather, rather well uh, over this week. Though Czar has been the uh, Czar has been the highlight. Uh, Aussie dollar, we showed you that chart just a bit ago, but. And, and looking at uh, and looking at other strong currencies on the day, um, again we do have a jobs report later today. That is going to be important. Uh, however, I don't think that a pullback or a disappointment is going to shake the world. And the reason why 
twofold. Um, they shook the world on the positive side last uh, last month with the jobs report, uh, and and then in addition to that, and just in addition to that, and for what it's worth, there's about a uh, a fifteen thousand uh, increase expect uh, expectations uh, for Australian jobs, uh, but. The bigger thing is the increase in the normalization rate, which is, uh, or the neutral rate, uh, which the RBA announced in their minutes this week. So uh, that is when, and I shared with you guys yesterday, uh, that is where we started to see the fixed income market price in a hike in mid 2018 from the RBA. So uh, this is. This is this is moving cleanly higher, uh, and and again, this is the strong week pair as well. So uh, continue to keep an eye there. Uh, you can see the resistance that we're we're keeping an eye on, uh, which which quite simply uh, is above is above 80 right now. All right, going over to commodities, and I'll, I'll get into the details and the themes. It, it, a little bit deeper in just a moment. Uh, this is just an overall view of what's what's moving, what's shaking today. Uh, so rather positive, rather positive uh, EIA report. Uh, so that's the that's the weekly U.S. inventory data out of oil. Uh, we are putting pressure again on some key resistance. Now uh, the two levels that I would encourage you to watch: 47.29 is the opening range high for the month of July. It's also the opening range high for the second half of the year. So uh, I like to look at macro opening ranges. Macro opening ranges are the first two weeks of January, the first two weeks of July, uh, and, and quite simply, if we got a break and a, and a, and a close above 70, 70, excuse me, 47.29, that would be a macro opening range breakout. If we got a further break above 48.19, uh, which would be the 618 of this range here, it would also take us above this price channel. It would also take us above the Ichimoku cloud. You can see there's a, there's a handful of things uh, that could signal a larger shift taking place, and in fact, uh, for those of you that uh, want a bit more details on crude oil, uh, I had an article out earlier today after the report because uh, to me, and I'll explain some of these in just a moment. Uh, to me, there were some there were some rather encouraging reports out of uh, out of the EIA report. All right, and then over to copper. So copper is taking a step back, and in fact, if you look at the chart. You can see uh, we're falling at prior resistance. However, uh, however, I think that there is broader demand that is worth keeping an eye on. I'll actually uh, show you a line from Volvo's earnings uh, about the demand in China that uh, could show that uh, that that we'll continue to see demand for base metals. Uh, and then in terms of uh, in terms of equities, Chinese CSI, um, so so uh, their th one of their indices uh, is is pushing towards 2015 highs uh, as we see large caps extend gain. So uh, those are those are the uh, the movers and shakers there. Uh, let's go over to the most compelling chart. This to me is uh, Euro USD. So this is a pretty clean channel here uh, it driven, drawn, drawn excuse me on Euro USD. Uh, of course we have ECB tomorrow uh, and, and again the question is are we going to have are we going to have a talk down of the uh, of the euro by by the ECB. Uh, I, either way you look at it, um, you can see that we are pushing the top of this channel drawn back here. Oops, sorry. This channel drawn here, and in fact, let me see if I can get the other. This way we can see it a little bit broader. All right, so we're pushing up against channel resistance. Uh, we're put uh, with this red channel here, uh, which has done a good job of framing price action. We're pushing up against channel resistance here. Uh, however, however, any pullback here to me would still be for now an opportunity to buy. I know that sounds odd, uh, but if we do not get a shift that that uh, the ECB is going to re-ease or, or anything that would disappoint the euro bulls, uh, any pullback here I think would be an opportunity to buy. Uh, and again, I mentioned uh, Draghi speaking at Jackson Hole, that's the uh, the Federal Reserve of Kansas City annual meeting uh, where we've had rather large statements made in the past. Uh, probably one of the more significant was uh, Bernanke reintroducing or introducing the next round of QE uh, at that meeting and, and there's expectation uh, that Draghi could announce really more details of tapering uh, when he speaks there in August. All, all that being said, um, it's, it's worth noting that we could see, uh, for lack of a better word, a regime shift uh, if we break out of here. Uh, what's also fascinating uh, is that we are trading at the highest level since early January. Early January is also when QE from 
the ECB was done, was announced. So, uh, or, or January in and of itself, excuse me. But um, you can see here, if we get that breakout, we could be making a way into the upper teens. And so I think that that is absolutely something worth keeping an eye on. Now, uh, again, shorter term, we have what would what we'd call basically bearish divergence or negative divergence. Um, very, very strong move here. It's one that we've been keeping an eye on. Uh, my main argument, though, is that keep an eye on sentiment. Keep an eye on what's happening with dollar because uh, if we don't get a larger shift, we don't get a larger shift uh, in, in terms of the fundamental picture. And again, I look at that from multiple market views, uh, options, fixed income, things of that nature. Uh, then I think that any pullback here would be a buying opportunity for the euro. All right. Uh, so I'll come back to euro, but that uh, in no uncertain terms is the most interesting chart, especially going into the ECB meeting tomorrow. Not that I expect a lot from the ECB. However, it, it would align with their historical norm to talk it down a bit, uh, but only to potentially see it resume higher in the coming weeks. All right, so let's go over to rates. And, and rates uh, is often not a market that people trade, but it says so much about demand, capital flows, uh, and, and, and what, what's going on beneath the surface or behind price. Uh, I'll also bring a handful of charts here to explain the themes and things that are going on. Uh, but one of, the, one of the first things that I would share with you um, is that, uh, and, and in fact, there's a, there's a phrase going around called Volmageddon. It's so basically <laughs> Armageddon of volatility. There's been a there's been a drop in volatility of different markets. Whether you look at uh, commodities, uh, treasuries, and, and the TY VIX um, is basically a, 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 what you'd call almost a depressed market. Uh, volatility in the treasury market uh, is is very very low right now. Uh, recently closed at its lowest level since 2013. All that being said, and I mentioned I mentioned yesterday that while DXY and the 10-year yield are widening, uh, typically they had traded pretty closely together, uh, it might be that there is just the support here, uh, and, and you'll see in just a moment I, when I talk about something else, uh, that people are continuing to think that, hey, the Fed is going to hike. Even though they don't have the data really backing them up for further hikes, they also have rather easy financial conditions, uh, which, which uh, according to NY Fed President Bill Dudley, uh, is is showing them that basically they have they have the need to hike. They are almost being encouraged to hike. So uh, it's 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 this it's this fascinating back and forth that we see here versus the Fed thinking that they basically are being called on to hike because of how easy financial conditions are. But at the same time, economic data as we've seen through wage inflation, um, consumer price index, uh, PCE, all of these things that are continuing to disappoint. It's not just the U.S. We're seeing it in other places as well, but. Um, pretty pretty fascinating when you, when you see this very very low volatility. Um, the other thing, and, and again, this kind of goes against against that statement that the Fed is is going to just put the blinders on and keep hiking. Uh, but in the futures market of euro dollars, which is a market that places bets basically on deposit rates across the world, or no, also known as non-domestic U.S. dollar deposit accounts. Uh, and so what this futures market is basically showing when you start to look out later in the year, that there is an increased open interest of bets that would pay off if the Fed does not hike later this year. Um, if you have any familiarity with, uh, with Euro dollars betting, uh, especially at the CME, you know that it is magnitudes larger than any other pit out there. Um, and, and, and while they've gone more electronic, the volume done in the euro dollar pit, again, multitudes of, of oil, multitudes of SPX. Uh, and it just, it just goes to show this is a, this is a very heavily focused market, um, institutional in nature, uh, but nonetheless, often very intelligent bets are placed here. And it's just worth noting that we are seeing the swelling of open interest being placed on bets that, again, would pay off if the Fed does not hike uh, later this year. Uh, and, and right now, if you look at the interest rate probability, so uh, to pull up uh, to pull up what, what is being priced in on the market, uh, it slipped below 50% this week uh, that the Fed would hike in December. Uh, the, the, the expectation going into this was that on September you would get a you would get a announcement of a balance sheet runoff uh, and then in December you'd get a rate hike. And now it's starting to look like, well, we might get the balance sheet runoff announcement and beginning or initiation in September, whether or not we'll get the rate hike or not, we'll, we'll see. And, and again, I, I think you can make credible arguments for either one, um, one for hikes, which I'll again uh, make a little bit later. All right, uh, another thing that we're seeing here, and, and this is important just because uh, 
one one way to measure how the market is expecting or what the market is expecting of the ECB uh, is to look at euro area yields, most notably bond yields. So let me go over to uh, go to DE tens. And so as these as these push higher, uh, basically you're you're getting this selling off, um, this this selling off of actually holding holding the European debt. Uh, this in this example would be German debt, uh, which is quite simply another way of looking at pricing in ECB hawkishness. Because so much of the reason why uh, the yields went negative was people buying it ahead of the ECB statements. So basically, you know, if I know a central bank is behind me to buy, if I can buy it before them, it's likely going to go up in price a lot. And that's what we saw with that negative yield. So as we start to see this yield push higher, it's basically an indication of people saying, listen, tapering is coming. You know, ECB tightening is on its way, uh, and again, that's a, that's a, that's an indication that we are looking at a uh, more hawkish ECB than we have been dealing with with in any time in the last handful of years. And so, uh, that to me is an argument again to watch for that larger normalization, potentially that regime shift uh, of a stronger euro. We might get some hints tomorrow. I'm hoping we do. Uh, but either way, as this yield pushes higher, and we're seeing it at different parts of the curve and from different European bond markets, uh, that could be an indication that, again, there, there, there is going to be uh, more support more support under, under the euro. Uh, other thing worth noting, uh, and I'm about to get to some charts that, that break down all of these because I know that they're um, – they're they're hard to visualize uh, just just by talking them. So the charts are often very helpful, and I'll have a handful of charts here for rates in just a moment. Uh, but is gilt continue to outperform? Now, gilts are uh, uh, are British bonds. Uh, what's noted, what's what's important to note though, is if a if a if a debt market is outperforming, that's typically a risk off view. Um, so as we're seeing the yields push lower in the UK, uh, that tends to be a lack of vote of confidence, if you will, that the Bank of England will hike, that Brexit negotiations will go well, uh, that CPI will will do well. And just for what it's worth, tomorrow, tomorrow we are going to have uh, UK retail sales. So uh, definitely a bit of volatility to watch for in terms of euro pound because you're going to have not only ECB but as well you're going to have the UK retail sales all right so let's go to some charts here for fixed income the the chart that that is naturally taken a lot of focus uh, has been the TNX and a TNX is the 10-year US Treasury yield the uh, reason why it's important is because you know quite simply the the two-year seems roughly fixed and what I mean by that is that the Fed seems the Fed seems pretty set on a handful of hikes now while the market is calling their bluff on how many times they will hike uh, we, we've seen some stability there in the front end of the curve which seems to be a game that a lot of central bankers are playing understandably so the 10-year though and further out you go is more we start to play with okay what is expected growth uh, you know what 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 is anticipated here in terms of inflation and things of that nature 30 years a bit more inflation heavy than than 10-year but nonetheless you can see here we we, we saw this breakout which I have up here in the top right of this chart um, and we broke out uh, came above the Ichimoku cloud just a bit uh, came above this price channel and now we're retesting this trend line support we you can see we did almost this exact same pattern uh, back in Q4 back in October before this very very aggressive rally so um, no crystal ball here I'm not telling you exactly what's gonna happen um, I, I, I would tell you though it, betting on one side or the other. I think I would bet on downside as opposed to upside. Uh, and in fact, let me pull up the chart just to tell you why. All right, so this is the live chart here. As a, as a technician, I have to follow the trend, <laughs> and there is no doubt. Uh, and, 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 and Japan would, would attest to uh, the pain of a long-term fixed income trend, uh, that, that the trend is lower, uh, and that we continue to see these lower lows and lower highs. So um, of the two, we definitely favor a, uh, a breakdown in yields, a push higher in the price of the rates. Uh, but nonetheless, this is definitely worth watching. Uh, again, if this breaks down, it likely means that we're not going to have as hawkish of a central bank as as was previously anticipated. Uh, this is the price, so TNX is looking at yields. This is the price but of UK yields. So uh, when looking at that, you can see this seems to be turning up. And uh, it, I think it is going to be very, very important. I've shared with you guys before that basically the, the tripod that Carney is looking at. Uh, and, and with that, uh, a big part of that uh, is this argument as to whether or not we're going to get a successful 
Brexit negotiations, whether or not we're going to get wage inflation, whether or not we're going to get strong private investment growth out of businesses, uh, and 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 that seems a difficult that seems a difficult uh, hand to be to to reach right now. Um, and so, if we continue to see gilt yields uh, pushing higher, uh, or, excuse me, gilt yields pushing lower, the price of gilts pushing higher, uh, then that sets up this environment where we could continue to see basically a cap on on upside in uh, in sterling. Because again, you're just not pricing in any BOE hawkishness, whereas other banks are, uh, and and again, they're starting to uh, they're starting to to tickle the idea of stagflation in the UK, which is basically inflation without growth, which is just you know when you when you're dealing with uh, fixed income or when you're dealing with uh, pensioners, whatever it may be, that is just a horrible. That's it's just a, it's a scary environment. Scary environment. All right, next uh, next chart here. Uh, this is showing a narrowing, a narrowing of uh, Spanish yields over German yields. And and again, when you're when you're looking at a compression of yields, uh, it's it's tending it's tending to show you that uh, there is a bit less fear. Whether you look at premiums or yield spreads, uh, and and one of the yield spreads that I've shown you guys multiple times throughout this uh, throughout the last few months uh, is dollar cat. But what I want to show you here, quite simply, is that it's it's another sign uh, as yields from different areas start to push higher that we could see some euro support. So uh, again, looking at this chart in no uncertain terms, we're at resistance from a few different from a few different forms of technical analysis. We're at resistance on euro USD. Um, however, it seems like from a broader perspective, we are seeing environments that would lead to that would lead to euro support. So again, we'll keep an eye on what happens tomorrow with the ECB. If we just get a flat breakout tomorrow, maybe there is some type of surprise hawkishness, which again would be out of character for the ECB when they've had the strength they've had. Uh, it could it could be a more immediate regime change, if you will. I mean, it's been breaking out as is, uh, and it's one of the least amounts of times required to go from the bottom of this channel to the top of the channel. Uh, but nonetheless, I think even if we get a pullback, it doesn't mean that the bullish pitch is is done for uh, but ag again whether you look at uh, this this picture here showing that the yield spread uh, that the yield premium if you will of Spanish uh, to German uh, is uh, is less than 100 or you look at this which just shows in it, basically in tandem eurozone yields uh, are rising as tapering expectations grow uh, it seems to favor again that uh, the, the, the bond market believes what Draghi said in Sintra, uh, that quite simply tapering will come. And yesterday, I believe it was, I, I shared the uh, the quote from the ECB chief economist, Prate, uh, who noted quite simply that, listen, as front end expectations uh, start to show inflation, bond buying doesn't really make sense anymore. Uh, and that's that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, this is a different market, but again, it's, it's not necessarily uh, the actual price on it as much as what it's communicating. Uh, so this is for U.S. munis. Uh, municipal bonds are not a hotly covered market, but what this is showing, I think, is just indicative of what we're seeing in risk assets, whether it's EMFX, whether it's stocks, whatever it may be. Uh, and that's quite simply that a risk premium, so going out further in the yield curve, uh, does not require from investors the type of premium it used to. A bit of an advanced concept, but that's okay. The main thing to take away from here is that risk is being sought. So that is going to align quite simply with S&P pushing higher. Um, you know, we, you could see here uh, we are pushing to the top of this channel. I mentioned earlier the uh, uh, the CSI in China uh, is pushing to the highest level since 2015. Uh, but all, all that being said, you look at a chart like this and, and you see that a a lower premium is being demanded to go out further on the yield curve. It is basically a risk on development. So that's the key thing there. Another risk on development is low treasury volatility. Uh, I know this is a lot of charts, so I appreciate you guys hanging with me as we go through rates. Next, we'll get to commodities and then rates, or, and then FX. Uh, but the thing to show you here, so this is that TY VIX I was showing you guys earlier. Uh, the, the, the blue line is the yield. The white line is that treasury VIX. You can see that we're basically sitting at the lowest level since 2013. Now, what's also worth noting is that last time we were this low, we've had blow-ups pushes higher in volatility. And and again, when, whenever there's a blow-up in volatility, typically people run to certainty. That's certainty equivalence 
gets a high premium, and, and so that leads to uh, uh, that 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 leads to uh, pretty pretty big moves here. All that being said, uh, you can see how low the volatility is. What happens next? We'll see. Again, I like that long-term trend that says lower yields. Uh, however, it's worth keeping an eye on uh, that potential for a push higher. There's a, there's a lot there's a lot to be determined here, uh, and, and and fixed income is a hard market to get your head around. But all that being said, uh, we're not seeing volatility here. Here's another market which this shows last week we had a very 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 disappointing inflation and retail sales data release. This chart's borrowed from Bloomberg, but it shows how how strong of a drop. I mean, it was, a, it was really it was a crash uh, in the uh, in the expected volatility. Uh, so it's it's it's. It's basically, to me, an indication. If you're not expecting a lot of volatility in fixed income, um, it is an environment that says, okay, people are going to go out and they're going to bid up risk, which we're seeing in EMFX and we're seeing in equities. All right, this is on to commodities. So uh, rather encouraging report if you looked at the EIA numbers today. Uh, the, the key thing here, and in fact, let me pull up a crude oil chart. Uh, actually, I'm going to pull up this chart first. So this is a chart showing, um, this is a chart, uh, it's, it's, it's crude oil overlaid with gas prices, um, crude oil stockpiles, uh, but overlaid with gas prices. Uh, the the thing the thing that I would just mainly encourage you to keep an eye out for, uh, and this is the chart here, is again that 47.29 to 48.20. Uh, when you look at the details of the report. Uh, out of out of Riyadh or in Saudi, they basically delivered the lowest amount they've delivered uh, to the U.S. since or U.S. imports from Saudi is another way of, of, of looking at that uh, as the lowest since 2010, showing them making true basically on one of the commitments of the OPEC. Uh, production curve. Uh, the other thing, you had an inventory drop of 4.7 million barrels and a, and a nice uh, increase in, uh, in, in oil products, also known as gasoline. So uh, pretty encouraging there. Uh, this was a, a, again, one to, one to keep an eye out for because to me it's one of those things that could be indicative of commodity demand. So in, in Volvo's earnings report, they noted that Chinese heavy duty truck markets rose by 72%. Um, they, they noted in quote, out of China, they were seeing a good freight environment or train, uh, good freight environment and higher construction activity. To me, that's just worth, that's just worth putting in your back pocket, noting, okay, demand seems to be picking up. While it might not necessarily be oil heavy, and there's actually another report about that, um, that the, uh, the, the Chinese oil demand uh, might be basically falling over time. If you looked at a, uh, a note from the state-run China Petroleum and Chemical Corp, that's the globe's largest refiner, uh, they're basically looking at more alternative uh, more alternative fuel sources in China. So while oil demand might be net net lower looking into the future in China uh, than other people would expect it to be, it still shows a base metal demand, which to me is long-term positive, you know, whether you look at copper, iron ore, rebar, things of that nature. So worth noting. Uh, this is another another tidbit I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, so there's a Bloomberg function that lets you test out different systems and basically how different indicators are uh, are acting in an environment for certain assets, and that's that's helpful because it's another way of seeing what's doing well and what's not doing well. Basically, what it shows, if you looked at the Bloomberg Commodity Index, you're not seeing trend following uh, trend following studies do well in commodities. Put another way, that we're range bound. Uh, one of the top performing uh, indicators of the last year, uh, when trading with commodities, was a moving average oscillator. So, you know, quite simply, you're you're, you're buying when you're crossing from the bottom up, uh, and you hit a signal line. You're selling when you turn down from the bottom, or from the turn down from the top and crossing under the signal line. Either way you look at it, it's roughly range bound. And so that would that would indicate, listen, we shouldn't anticipate a breakout in oil. We shouldn't anticipate anticipate different breakouts in this environment. Uh, but nonetheless, just just worth noting that uh, for those of you that trade commodities over the last year, that has been the more favorable trading strategies, a more range bound, oscillating based approach. Uh, and then in terms of copper, let's go to some metals here. So we're going to go to copper first, uh, and we showed you that chart a bit earlier. Uh, so looking rather similar to uh, to Q1 2017, this push higher. Uh, again, uh, the Chinese picture has has picked up in no uncertain terms, and so because of that, uh, I think that there's a bit more premium placed on the upside for copper uh, than than we've seen in the past. Now it is worth noting that uh, hedge funds reduced their bullish copper bets to the lowest in four weeks. 
you might see a pullback there, but again, I think that the fundamentals that we're seeing for base metals uh, tend to be tend to be positive. And then gold. So the main thing we've been looking at in gold was the break above this June line. Uh, obviously, with that uh, that very high overnight number. Uh, again, overnight options for euro yen highest since April when you had the first round of the French election. Uh, that could be a spark there for a uh, for a nice rise in gold, any, any type of volatility that comes from that. Uh, and then, of course, this is uh, a, a pretty strong benefactor uh, off, of, uh, off of this downtrend as well, though we're not seeing it as strong as we usually do. Um, so we are still below multiple forms of resistance. This very, very large red line here, let me pull this up. This very, very large red line goes back to the 2011 high. Um, so we basically peaked above it and then saw this strong breakdown. Uh, however, I, I would encourage you to just keep an eye on the fact that uh, we do we do seem to have we do seem to be withdrawing from this environment that uh, is saying that gold should just sell off. Um, and what I mean by that is that while equities remain high, while emerging markets and risk on remain high, uh, there there is still I would say um, tender for for risk, uh, how, however you want to call that. Uh, inflation doesn't seem to be creeping its ugly head in the way people thought. You know, really we're getting uh, hawkish central banks in spite of lower inflation. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, keep an eye here just because this, this seems to be finding support in that 12 to 1220 zone consistently. So that seems to be encouraging. Again, it's too early to call it a you know a bullish breakout or get excited here. Uh, but I think if we can if we can get a move, uh, if we can get a move uh, higher or at least hold hold above, and this is going to be a more short-term technical analysis. But let me bring it up. So we've had this rather nice move here. If we can get a hold above, I think it's around 1225. Yeah, that that would that would be in no uncertain terms that would be a bullish Elliott wave development. Basically, it would show that there's no overlap and that we're making that strong move higher. So uh, while this is going down to a smaller frame uh, to, to to find the analysis, if we can prevent overlap, meaning price breaking below 1225, it would show that a bullish structure is holding case, uh, and that that in and of itself, from just a pure technical perspective, never mind the weak dollar uh, and other things out there. Um, but that that would show that there is a uh, a grounding for a, a a push higher in gold, and again ECB BOJ does not hurt. All right, let's go over to FX. Sorry guys, this is a bit of a longer session. In terms of FX, again, strong week is Aussie USD. So Aussie is the strongest, dollar is the weakest. Um, you can see there, basically strongest currencies, Aussie, CAD, and Euro. Weakest currencies, uh, you currently have dollar, yen, and Swiss. And again, yen and Swiss being the weakest currencies, if nothing else, is just another indication of this risk on move, which looking at stocks, you don't need me to tell you that, but if anything else, it, it should encourage uh, you to avoid buying yen, buying Swiss, um, and these these other risk off type of uh, type of environments. Uh, okay, so uh, this is this is one that I think I think opens up a <laughs> a conundrum. And, and what that is is you know the U.S. data is very weak. Uh, again, on a on a relative basis, or if you look at the like the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Economic Surprise Index from from City, uh, it is just. It, it has been downright disappointing, uh, especially if you look at it from a relative basis. We have turned a bit higher, but expectations are a cyclical game. I mean, if you continue to underperform, all of a sudden economists are going to say, okay, maybe the economy is worse than it is, and then newsprints start to outperform that, and okay, maybe it's better than it is, and it's it's this ongoing cycle. All that being said, if you look at the Chicago Federal Reserve Financial Conditions Index, or the National, Fed, the National Financial Conditions Index, uh, we are at our lowest level since mid-2014. Um, that could keep the Fed hiking, because again, given everything that's gone on in terms of QE, the Fed does kind of see it as their responsibility to make sure that inflation doesn't all of a sudden just show up out of nowhere like a thief in the night. Um, and so we've heard from Dudley, uh, it was actually a speech that he made in, um, uh, I believe it was in Basel, Switzerland, uh, but, but talking about how given the financial conditions being so easy that they have to keep hiking, that they, they have to keep, they have to keep an environment where uh, inflation doesn't all of a sudden sneak up because easy financial conditions means borrowing is easier, people continue to borrow, things of that nature. So 
it it puts it puts it puts the Fed in a in a in a rough position. I mean, I know nobody feels sorry for them, but uh, at the at the same time, you have disappointing inflation, disappointing disappointing uh, wage inflation. Uh, just disappointing data in general, um, and, and so and so with that, it does seem like you have a fundamental environment backing them up that says maybe you shouldn't hike. But based on what we've heard from New York Fed President Bill Dudley, uh, and based on what we've heard from Yellen and in, um, in, uh, at the Congress, uh, at the Congress uh, meeting last week, it, it does seem like that they would continue to hike. So again, it's it's a rough scenario, but uh, I don't think that it's going to keep the dollar. A, a strong round of buying, but it might limit some of the dollar downside, uh, and that just came out this morning. The uh, the NFCI. All right. Uh, so BOJ, I mentioned this earlier. They are expected to be the only non-tightening central bank in 2018, uh, and and basically where that leaves me is keeping an eye on dollar yen. Basically looking at dollar yen top sides. So let me go over to the chart again. So we've seen breakouts, rightfully so, uh, in things like euro yen, um, Aussie yen. Uh, seen some uh, some of the Scandies do rather well against the yen. Cad yen's been another one, uh, but the, the the main thing that I would note here is that if we are able to get a breakout, uh, and, and really on a shorter term chart, so this is a one hour chart. On the shorter term chart, it's basically this. I think it's 1290 is what I'd be keeping an eye on. If we can get a breakout above there, whether it's a dovish ECB or a bit of a turnaround on the on uh, on the dollar. I don't like buying the weakest currency, so I'm not saying I'm not saying buy dollar yen right now. But if we get a break above that, it's definitely one to keep on your radar. Because if if the BOJ, whether you call it doubling it down or just keeping their blinders on, just like the Fed is keeping their blinders on and, and wanting to keep hiking and staying rather hawkish, the the, the BOJ is basically on the other side of that spectrum. They're keeping their blinders on, basically staying dovish. And so, uh, if that if that returns to more yen weakness, I think dollar yen is one to watch. 1290 is a specific level that I'd keep an eye on. Uh, the other thing, uh, of course, let me just go to a few other yen crosses. Since we have uh, since we have uh, the BOJ meeting coming up, uh, this one, as you can imagine, nice nice setup for volatility with uh, uh, with employment data out of Australia. Uh, BOJ, pound yen. Um, that's another one where uh, sentiment's pulled back a bit, but still seems to favor uh, some. Still seems to favor some upside there. I don't like buying pound necessarily when you have some other ones. Um, and then euro yen. This is another one. If we get a pullback from a structural position, this looks like we're setting up for a three-wave pullback, which could could give you a nice entry point. So um, again, you look at the uh, the overnight risk on uh, on euro yen, highest since the first round of the French election. Uh, and this could pull back a bit. And it does seem technically, again, the history we've had with ECB, it seems like it's setting up for a euro pullback, but that could be a, a, a greater opportunity overall. Uh, and then CAD, we continue to see CAD strength. In fact, let's go over to dollar CAD. Uh, it hasn't gotten the attention it deserves of late because a lot of focus has been on Aussie and, and on Euro, uh, but we had strong factory sales data, and that seems to be showing that we are on our way to break below that May 2015 low. So May 2015 low is 2460. Sorry about that. Let me zoom in here. So 2460 is this level right here. Um, so it's it's seeming like we're on pace to break that. All right, let's go to sentiment and we'll close this up. You guys were so patient. I went about 15 minutes over, so I apologize for that. Uh, so looking at sentiment, the main thing to note here, uh, again, it, it goes to that. It goes to the. The idea I was talking about earlier, which is basically that you don't have people selling pound, euro yen which that would be a, that would be a nice bullish signal from a contrarian sentiment perspective what you have here uh, and what I want to draw your attention to uh, is this right here what you have is a bunch of longs getting out of the trends and, and so Aussie dollar which is a strong uptrend uh, and in fact you can see that and that's the one I've spent most of my time on this week is the increase week over week uh, in short Aussie dollar as an indication that we might see that continue uh, here you don't see much on the long side however you do see euro yen longs getting out of the trade uh, again if I go back to that chart Uh, and we'll close with this. Wrong. 
long chart. If we are just getting a simple pullback, then a break above 129.75 or 130 uh, would be a very nice setup, I think, for a clean continuation higher. Um, so looking at the sentiment, that's really the main thing that I wanted to share with you on that. Um, outside of that, most of the short positions that we're seeing being added are in equity indices, which also align with that risk on move we were talking about from different angles. Uh, but Hopefully, hopefully that just that shows you that there might be some actual some actual opportunities developing in euro to get it for sale, relatively speaking, uh, if we get the ECB talking it down tomorrow. So of course I'll have a session tomorrow, uh, which will break down what we've learned from the BOJ, what we've learned from uh, the ECB. But what I would encourage you to think about is that uh, if if the if the euro does sell off tomorrow, it might be setting up for a better opportunity to get long for a broader a broader resumption higher. Because again, most of the technical studies that I'm looking at are not euros done. It's that euros overcooked might need to cool off for a bit. Might be some profit taking from the institutions, which I mean, you're you're seeing from an institutional positioning standpoint, you are seeing uh, you're seeing hedge funds. Uh, the shortest they've been uh, against USD since I think it was, it was either 2014 or 2013. Uh, let me see if I can find the actual numbers there. 2013, yeah. So hedge funds, most bearish they've been on on uh, dollars since 2013, and rightfully so. That's been probably the best trade for them this year. Um, and, and so uh, while we could get a bit of a pullback, doesn't mean to me though that uh, that trade is that trade is done. Meaning dollar weakness, euro strength. So uh, with that, guys, appreciate so much all of your time. Um, ooh, here's yeah, I can look that up real quick. Question on looking at the uh, the risk reversals for euro yen. Risk reversals, for those of you who don't know, uh, is out of the money put premium to out of the money call premium. Um, and I hope it's okay. I'm not going to be able to pull up the chart for you guys to see, but I'll be able to explain it. Uh, so it has been, for lack of a better word, it's been correcting. So really, over the last month, we've 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 pulled lower, meaning that we're starting to see a yen premium build up, uh, or a down a put premium start to build up. Um, so we've seen this move lower uh, over the last month from a and and just so you guys know, yen crosses tend to have a almost fixed premium uh, for puts over calls because that's just another way of, of buying insurance, especially for carry traders out there globally speaking. So uh, you tend to see that, uh, but we are getting a we are getting a pullback. So glad you asked to take a look at that, Arjong. Um, it's it it is pulling back, um, and that's something I'll continue continue to keep an eye on as well. Still higher month over month um, by about twenty percent. It's just it's just actually pulled back, and a lot of that sharp run up was. Uh, from Centra. All right, guys, so with that, hope you have an excellent day. A uh, handful of events tomorrow. Uh, again, uh, over the next 24 hours at least, RBA uh, employment, pound retail sales, ECB, BOJ. Um, so a lot of stuff for us to, to follow up with on tomorrow. Take care, trade well. I'll, t I'll uh, have this recording up soon and an article kind of summarizing some of the key points up on DailyFX uh, in just a moment. Take care, guys. Bye.